It's the year 2040. <laughs> the MCU has surpassed all expectations and predictions of failure thanks to their new flagship hero, Frogman, the new Avenger, surpassing Avengers 8, Avengers World, to become the highest grossing film of all time with $7 billion. Billion? I'm actually sure they'd love to hear that become a reality, but that's the point, it's not. Frogman, hilarious as that would be, will not be saving anything, let alone a film franchise. After seeing the likes of Morbius and Blue Beetle, I think I'm good on those lesser known heroes for a bit. What the f I dropped a video discussing the state of affairs for the MCU, another video for the DCU, taking a look at where things have gone wrong, what could be done to possibly course correct, and this kind of wraps up the trilogy of vids because I want to elaborate on something I brought up previously. No one really cares about a C-list hero or your Passing of the Torch heroes movie unless the A-list heroes films are doing well. I'm sure someone will comment that their favorite hero is like Plastic Man or something, and to that I say, Go outside, nerd. Get out. Go. If I were Kevin Feige, I'd be sweating bullets trying to get the X-Men in here and praying to God that I hire the right person to direct Fantastic Four. because people care less and less about a character like Ant-Man if he's not connected to a bigger story with stronger personalities. Not every character is or needs to be as nuanced and intriguing as Batman to have success, but it seems like some people need to be reminded that those characters do require the top-level heroes in some capacity in order to thrive. The MCU at this point is the most egregious abuser of what I like to call the logo effect, the success of the franchise as a whole seemed to make Kevin Feige think people showed up because it said Marvel and not because of the characters. Fuck you. <coughs> Fuck you. Captain Marvel made over a billion dollars, proving it doesn't need to be Spider-Man in the front seat. We'll just totally ignore the fact that Captain Marvel was wedged between two of the biggest films in history and was made out to be required viewing to enjoy the finale. Now that the MCU is in a kind of freefall, let's see how the sequel performs. Eh? Fast forward to the present, and who could have predicted an Avengers squad consisting of Captain Marvel, Miss Marvel, Shang-Chi, not Black Panther, and Sam Wilson wasn't going to hold a candle to a team of Iron Man, Captain America, Hulk, Thor, Black Widow, and the real Black Panther. It seems like Feige's leaning on the Avengers you call when the real Avengers are busy, but even if the film's post-endgame were almost all high quality, it would feel like something's missing and that law of diminishing returns would surely kick in no matter what once the big guns went away. It's why we don't have a world of James Bond. They don't create derivative characters or knockoffs to place within his world. They have new interpretations of that character. Not to suggest there needs to be an MCU reboot and let's just get a new version of Iron Man and Hulk every 10 years, forever. But it doesn't change the fact that low-tier hero-led movies can be good fun, but usually only as supplemental. So maybe the real way to go is to not multiverse reboot every decade, but take a decade off. Have you ever Googled yourself and were shocked to find your personal information on one of those public listing sites? Yeah, me too. Googling my name, I can find my previous addresses, workplaces. It's creepy and feels incredibly intrusive. Data brokers are making a fortune selling our information to robocallers, spammers, and others who want to learn more about us, like where we live. That's why I'm excited to tell you about today's sponsor, Aura. Aura can identify data brokers exposing your info and submit opt-out requests on your behalf. Brokers are legally required to remove your info if you ask them to, but they make it super hard to do, and Aura will handle it for you. You can try Aura free for two weeks using my link, and Aura does so much more to protect you from online threats you can't see. It's really easy to set up so you don't have to download several different apps to get things like parental controls, antivirus, VPN, password management, identity theft insurance, and more. You get everything at one affordable price. Let Aura do the hard work of keeping you safe online so you can focus on other tasks with peace of mind. You can let people continue to exploit and profit off your private info, or you can go to my link right here to start your two week free trial, also linked in the description. There are a number of issues plaguing current superhero films and television shows. We've gone over poor writing, multiverse excuses to do anything and everything with no real consequence, identity politics, I know, that's surprising. But I don't hear much discussion about the fact that there aren't many interesting heroes on screen right now. 
Like, that's a foundational problem. You have the upper echelon, the A-list, the Mount Rushmore. For me personally, I'm a Spider-Man, Batman, and Wolverine guy. And even though I don't like Superman that much, he's quite literally the archetype. So he has to be up there even if by default. And there are more than those four that are in that upper sphere, but we'll focus on these few for examples of excellence. What separates these heroes from the rest of the pack and what made studios prioritize them sways from simple and obvious to complicated. There are a number of books that have been written breaking down the psychology of Batman, video essays up the ass about the impact of Spider-Man, and college courses taught on the impact of superheroes on culture, spearheaded by the quintessential one in Superman. These characters endure, and I think they endure because of some similarities. We can skip the obvious. All the characters look really cool, were extremely original designs aesthetically, and laid the groundwork for future creations. What all three possess is the essence of what makes a great hero. Their heroism is ingrained in their story, their character, and their personality. All three have a burden of responsibility with their powers and have tragic origins that shape who and what they are and who they become. With Spider-Man, Peter Parker's constant inner battle is the struggle between using his powers for good and living up to Uncle Ben's words and having a normal life. Batman never wants what happened to his parents happen to anyone ever again, and he's dedicated his life to making sure of that by prowling the streets of Gotham. Superman was sent here from a dying planet, our son amplifying his gifts and his adoptive parents instilling an understanding in him that he's meant to be a savior and leader of mankind. A sense of duty, saving lives and protecting people is the core of these characters. Superman rarely wavers, Batman is brooding and cryptic, and Peter is anxious and trying to get by. Their personalities are different, but their core is similar. And again, to be fair, a lot of lesser-known superheroes have a similar core. These dudes were the foundational layers in a lot of ways, after all. But most of the heroes being pushed right now in film and TV are second-rate or hand-me-down, passing-the-mantle sort of stories. I've said it before, and I'd find it hard to find anyone who disagrees, that Iron Man, Captain America, and Thor weren't necessarily C- or D-listers, but they weren't close to touching the cultural impact Batman or Spidey had until the MCU kicked off. They were big in comics, but everyone outside of comics knows who Batman is. He's a cultural phenomenon. Comic fans knew how awesome Iron Man is, but the wider cultural impact was when his movie finally hit theaters. Tony Stark and Steve Rogers are intriguing characters with depth to them. Just like Batman or Superman, Steve Rogers' story as the hero Captain America is linked completely to his personality. During World War II, he was small and frail and frequently bullied, which fed his desire to do anything he could to help because, like he said, he doesn't like bullies. Tony is different than the others mentioned because of his unhinged narcissism, but his need to be Iron Man to make up for the sins of his weapons manufacturing company gives him that sort of tragic origin that most of these current, less interesting heroes are missing. The sort of heroes that are taking up the mantle, for example. I'm not a personal fan of it in this genre, although it can work sometimes, but most often it doesn't and the film becomes this flat, by-the-numbers, standard fare. The most recent example is Blue Beetle, where Jaime Reyes literally takes the mantle of Blue Beetle. A character being thrust into unknown and wondrous circumstances can be a great bedrock for a story, but this kind of thing is what separates a wannabe Spider-Man-Iron Man hybrid with the real deal. Spider-Man's tragic story makes being a hero a fundamental part of who he is. I mean, shit, the new Spider-Verse movie made the phrase, it's a canon event, into a summer meme. Blue Beetle's the typical mantle tale. There was a hero who existed once before, new main character finds him or herself with the thing that gave the hero his powers, so that means new character needs to hero it up now. Oh, and then Jaime and his family go on a killing spree, basically, which is weird, but that's beside the point. Obviously, Spider-Man is more popular than Blue Beetle, but look at what the fundamentals are for why. Jaime finds the Scarab, and he's kind of like, yeah, I have a superhero costume, I gotta do the superhero thing then. Peter does the superhero thing because it's become part of his entire being, his personality, until he felt like this is what he has to do. There are completely different routes to get to that feeling, but hey man, it's not the destination, it's the journey. Even Miles Morales, who is quite literally a purposeful derivative of Peter Parker's Spider-Man, took a while to really come into his own and I'd argue is still doing so. The Spider-Verse films have been great, but the Spider-Verse is an altered version of a Peter Parker story, mixed with Miles' origins, aka, yeah, he got bit by a spider. The animated show Batman Beyond is the one time I remember really enjoying the mantle passing thing. Again, I don't want to get away from the fact that if you do things right, most things can be pulled off. I mean, Kevin Garnett said it best. Anything's possible! Anything's possible! 
But this style of storytelling, the mantle character, is infecting a lot more than just the superhero genre. Anything to do with the nostalgia act, like the recent Indiana Jones movie, for example, or the Star Wars sequel trilogy, it's just worse in the realm of super people because they have to physically don a costume and look like some variant or derivative or general store version of the real hero. Talking about variations, there's also C and D list heroes with the writing crutch you've definitely heard of, Mary Sue characters. These come in all shapes and sizes, and it's nothing new, just like superheroes, but it's gotten excessive in recent years. Look at Riri Williams, the character meant to replace Iron Man, who has, thankfully, had her show placed on indefinite hiatus. But origin stories of characters like these are shockingly different from what makes Batman's or Spider-Man's origin so special. Her first appearance in both the comic and her appearance in Black Panther 2 shows a girl who wants to prove her teacher wrong and create a fucking Iron Man suit. In the comics, it's even worse. She begs the teacher to victimize her. It's truly awful writing. Riri Williams is essentially a supervillain origin story, not a story of heroism, triumph, and tragedy. None of that stuff. The comic book superhero movie as a genre had a number of false starts, with Richard Donner's Superman in the 70s proving people could have a major interest. Then Burton's Batman in 1989 was a gargantuan hit. The year 2000's X-Men was a financial success thanks to a mildly terrified 20th Century Fox, providing only a $75 million budget. But it would be 2002's Spider-Man that kicked that shit right off, though. $130 million budget, over $800 million in worldwide ticket sales, and the biggest boom was still yet to come because the Avengers wouldn't hit for another decade. With studios putting out a diet of films starring major players that they were excited about, Disney and WB would reach into the bag of tricks consisting of thousands of comic book characters and dug for the lower rung of heroes to see what else they could cook up. That's how we ended up with Guardians of the Galaxy shooting into the stratosphere of popularity, from obscure comic heroes to bona fide stars. But the studio would have never taken a risk on the property if Avengers hadn't just made over $1.6 billion. My point is the cost to produce, market, and distribute a movie, at least for superhero dumping studios, has shot up astronomically since Guardians 1 and Spider-Man, though. Guardians 1 came out in 2014 and cost $170 million plus marketing costs. While this year's The Marvels cost about $250 million to make, and that's before marketing. I'll also be interested to see if the Guardians characters endure or if they're just popular versions of them. Guardians has succeeded on the big screen, meanwhile Batman, Spidey, etc. have succeeded on almost every level of entertainment. Time will tell if the Guardians are popular, or if people just really like Chris Pratt as Star-Lord, and the Guardians eventually suffer the fate of other formerly lesser knowns. Batman, Spider-Man, Wolverine, Superman, these are characters that are commodities and won't be going away. Maybe they'll lie dormant for a bit, but they'll be around. They can be worth spending that kind of money to produce. But these B, C, and D-list heroes films cost quite a bit of cheddar cheese, too. Sometimes all the way up to Avengers-level budgets. And sometimes that level of investment is worth dumping into Captain Marvel. If you know it'll do big business being sandwiched between Infinity War and Endgame. But if Captain Marvel or Ant-Man is all you have, well, you get Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania results. A box office bomb. No one cares about your C-list heroes unless you give us a reason to. And I was saying this the weekend Blue Beetle came out, so screw it. Shameless plug for the live stream. Here's a really short clip from Beast Up, also known as the best show in the universe. Probably. And yes, I'm wearing sunglasses. I might have been a little inebriated here, but we'll just keep that a secret between us. Cynic. Any any final words? <laughs> um, this movie made me realize why I like the superheroes I do. Because this is just a... Um, even though he's an original character, uh, it's still kind of more of like a, a passing of the mantle type of story. And I feel like the best superheroes... Um, like Captain America or Spider-Man or Batman or Black Panther or Blade. Like all of these characters have what they do, which is being a superhero and saving people's lives, like integrated into their story and their background. And these like mantle-esque or straight up passing of the mantle characters are just incredibly boring. It's not like, oh, you're, it's the... Um, across the Spider-Verse problem where it's like, oh, you're a Spider-Man? Well, you have to do this now. Whereas Peter Parker's story, like his guilt over his uh, uncle's death fed into like, I need to stop this from happening or Batman's parents' death or Captain America being picked on during World War II and wanting to fight Nazis and he hates bullies. 
like all that's integrated into their character and these other ones are boring and i think a lot of people need to ask themselves is like yeah it's a passing of the time thing so if it's on a streaming network go for it but if it's in the movie theater is it worth your money absolutely not it's not interesting it's just a it's another one that you've seen a million times so this wraps up my little trilogy of videos on the superhero genre unfortunately the writer strike is over <laughs> So my plans for videos for the rest of the year will probably shift around. Either way, there's plenty more to come before the end of the year. In the meantime, you can watch my live show that I co-host with The Little Platoon every Monday on BSUP. And we have a dedicated archive and clip channel for that. I also have another channel where I post smaller reviews and there's a completely random one dropping soon there. Here on the main channel, channel memberships are also open. As well as Patreon. And if you're a channel member or a patron, there are some cool perks for either one. And if you're ever interested in being a guest on BSUP, you can follow me on x slash Twitter, Instagram, or shoot me an email. We do prefer guests that have some sort of social media. It doesn't matter what size your channel is, but there really are no rules. If you have something interesting to say, we probably want to hear you. Till next time. Go outside, nerd. GG's. Get out. Go. I ain't got time to be distracted by your worthless chime-ins. Go on.